Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bethany Baptist Church here in Ottawa uh, for our Bible study in association with BereanNation.com. Let's open in prayer. Who can I victimize to do that for me this evening? <laughs> uh, Dan, would you open in prayer for us this evening? Lord God, we are loving Heavenly Father. We thank you that we are free to come together to, uh, to fellowship and especially to uh, learn and study your word and, and try to learn and do your will. We ask that you send the Holy Spirit with guidance for us to, uh, to better learn about uh, Romans chapter 7. Uh, I pray this in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So, before we get uh, into the chapter, let's get into the chapter. We need to read it first. Uh, let's see. There are there will be 25 one. verses. What if we split that into four that would make a, a reading of six verses each, and I can pick up the extra one. Maybe, Susan, if you could read verses one to six, then Dan the next six, Alex the next six, and I'll finish up. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is, she is released from her bond of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries with another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brother, you also have died with the law to the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions were out of our law, were at work in our members bear to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which is held as captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? If the law sin, God forbid. No, I have not known sin but by the law, for I have not known lust except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Ra rather was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin, by affecting my death, through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Verse 19. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find the, then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. 
For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, my flesh with the law of sin. We thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Uh, hey Dan, does verse 19 read, The good which I would I do not, that which I would not that I do? Pretty much. Okay. That's that's the King James E's I remember from verse 19. So. If you want me to track King James? Yeah, please. Please. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Okay. All right. So we run a public Bible study around here. And, you know, we've opened in prayer. We've read the text. We're in Romans chapter 7 tonight. Who came with a Bible study that they've at least attempted? Okay, we got one. Right on. Uh, I think it's uh, basically about uh, there's a law of sin that dwells as a dwells in us. Okay. Uh, but then there's also a spiritual uh, law that fights within us, fights with this law of sin. And sometimes we sin and sometimes we and most of the times we we obey the the spiritual law. You know? Right, okay, I gotcha. And that that's what you saw in the chapter. Yeah. In general. Okay, fair enough. It's nice to know that you thought about it ahead of time. Um, because it was only the one, I guess it's my turn now. So I've prepped one. Normally I explain the three rules before you give your, your thing, but that's cool. Uh, the three questions that we always ask ourselves is first, what does the chapter say? And it takes the form of what you see on the board here. I, I divide it into paragraphs. I give each paragraph sort of a, a summary title. And then I pick out a key verse that to me is critical in my understanding of the chapter, at least this time through. So that's what it, what it says. The second question is, what does that mean? Not, what does it mean to me? Which is how I first learned all of this. And that's not wrong, that's not right. What it means to me is irrelevant. What did God mean when he said that thing there? That's what we wanna know. And the final question is, well, if that's what it says, and that's what that means, what application can I take away from that? What can I do about it? Because we want to learn to please the master and do what it is he says. And sometimes those are a little further afield. Sometimes they can be very, very specific. Sometimes they're just a general principle to bear in mind. Either way, those are the three questions. You'll notice that's exactly what I do here. Now, before I get into what I have to say, I want to try uh, to review where we've come from it's always useful to recall uh, for present context. So I always think of short reviews in order. Um, you might note that these kind of get repetitive, but that just kind of helps drive it into your brain a little bit. Okay, uh, now in chapter one, after Paul introduces himself, his credentials, his audience, and his orchestra, uh, scratch the orchestra, he, he begins to speak about the subject that we have now become uh, we have now come to term radical depravity in our understanding of scripture. And he even details that in chapter one, verses 18 to 32. And uh, now he gives both reasons there and examples regarding the terrible and approaching wrath of God. In chapter two, he becomes a little more specific and he addresses a specific target audience. And that's the Jew in their midst. Now, perhaps because some had uh, some kind of mental agreement that Jesus was the guy to follow, but had still not really come to love, trust, and, and accept Christ as their Savior and Lord fully, but they still relied instead on their own Jewish rituals, rites, signs, memberships, and specific organizations for their salvation. Paul went on to explain that there's no ritual, there's no rite, there's no sign, there's no place, there's no set of words or actions, there are no spells you can cast 
or membership in any specific earthly group that can have a salvific effect. That salvation, the Greek word soteria, only comes from one place for everyone, that being Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and tells us not only why we need to be saved from the coming wrath, but the hows and whens and whys and heretofores of it. Then in chapter, uh, then in, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> um, right, now Romans chapter 3 talks about the straight up gospel, and it tells us not only why we need to be saved from that coming wrath, but how that can happen. And in chapter 4, we saw Abraham, who is our Old Testament example of justification by faith. Now, the chapter discussed in detail that Abraham was not justified uh, by following the law because the law came 430 years after Abraham. That couldn't happen, right? Um, and it wasn't by circumcision either because when this covenant was cut, it was a unilateral covenant that God made and performed all by himself before circumcision was ever given as a sign of the covenant. Okay? Um, and, and it was, yeah, okay. And then in chapter 5, we saw uh, how that extended to all of us who believe now. Uh, and it talked about how this justifies us before God or acquits us before God of the unrighteousness by our great substitute, the Lord Jesus, that took our place to pay for our sins, having lived the perfect life before God, and then knowingly and willingly surrendered it. Um, that's right, Jesus was not a victim. He was an active participant, um, as was the rest of the Godhead in the plan, by the way. However, the chapter briefly spoke about something else, uh, that we saw in chapter 6, which was sanctification, the process whereby God uses the difficulties that he allows, I argue engineers, uh, in our lives to make us more like his son. Uh, this will literally, by the way, take the rest of your life. Uh, but we must choose to yield to God and to work his work in our lives through the Holy Spirit within us. Within us. <laughs> within us. <laughs> And that, apart from my tongue that got wrapped around my eye teeth and couldn't see a word I was saying, Perfect. is the problem. Yeah, exactly. Is there an article in tongues? <laughs> no, I'm positive. I don't do that anymore. Uh, although I could. If you've never heard it, I could demonstrate that false stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the problem that we have. Though. We have to yield to God and His work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Uh, although we've been born again or redeemed, saved or born from above or born anew or regenerated uh, whatever term you're comfortable with here justified yeah ju well I haven't got there yet <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, justified is one of them though uh, and although we're renewed in our spirit by the indwelling part of the Holy Spirit we still live in the flesh and in the world system that's controlled by the father of lies so our own flesh is what we are to consider as dead. But it isn't easy because for now, it's still alive and it fights us. And we're, it's, you know, that's because it's still enslaved to sin through death. And that's what the entire subject of chapter seven is. So let's get into the chapter. I broke it down like you see on, on the, uh, the pad here. Ver I took my uh, key verses, verse 24. Who will set me free from this body of death? It just says, wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Verses 1 to 6, I said, dead to the law through Christ. 7 to 13, evil sin kills through the good law. And 14 to 25, the conflict of the old and the new natures. Now, who will set me free from this body of death? Paul here is about to juxtapose his own life with the reality of sin that dwells in his body, still corrupt, still trapped, still alive, still kicking. Uh, he's going to address it, though, with some sensitivity, 
lest all the Jews in the crowd want to pick up rocks and throw them at him until he dies. Uh, because one thing that the Jews were known for was the love of the law. And sometimes it was even so misplaced in them that they even worshiped the law and not the lawgiver. But just the same, that's how they were, and they came by it honestly. Um, for example, what happened with that? I don't know. Okay, no worries. Something fell off, something, I guess. Psalm 119 is a psalm of David, and it is the longest single chapter in the entire Bible at 176 verses. That's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet times eight verses per letter. Okay? Uh, its entire purpose, that psalm, is to extol the virtues of the law of God. David, of course, loved the Lord and his law and wrote in Psalm 138, verse 2, I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word according to all your name. How magnified is the name of God? Well, as supreme being, I would think pretty big. <laughs> And his word has the exact same weight of magnification. So here's Paul, having been saying for a bit now that the law is not what saves us. Okay? Angering all of the Jews in the pews uh, so that they're probably going, wait till that guy shows up, I'm going to have my pile of rocks ready, boy. Um, you know, the law has been fulfilled in Christ. The law made sin abound. The law could not save anyone. The law could only demand that penalty be paid. And that penalty for breaking it only ever always was death. Now, if you will recall from chapter 6, though, that even though by breaking the law we earn death to ourselves, God gave us a gift in that his son Jesus died on a Roman cross to pay that death penalty for all of us and has not only saved or justified us by that willing, knowing sacrifice, but has also changed and sanctified us by decree at that time, having made us a new creature in him. And that process, yes, will take the rest of your life. So as Paul Bilheimer once wrote, don't waste your sorrows. That is, don't let them go to waste. Live through them. Learn from them. Let them perfect you and sanctify you. Now, what does this mean for us now? Because we, who were immersed into his death and resurrected into his life, are still here, like Paul, in the flesh. Let's get into it. Verses 1 to 6. Dead to the law through Christ. Now, Paul here uses an example to demonstrate his meaning to his audience. As we were immersed into Christ's death, this has some direct implications. We read about some of that last time, but Paul's now going to keep on expanding on that. I'm just going to jump right in. Verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know law, that law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now, I'm going to pause there uh, just to point out that this is actually a very particular kind of Greek construction. It is not, I am speaking to those that know the law. He's not just targeting Jews. He is saying, I'm speaking to those who know law. What law? Any law. Greek law, Hebrew law, uh, you know, uh, traffic law. I'm not really sure it matters. Okay, remember that I said it was the Jew in the pew at this point that really wanted to stone Paul. Um, and that's, that's because of their reverence for the law of Moses. Now, I don't think that was necessarily even misplaced. A reverence for the law of God is always a good thing, and we're going to see that later. But even for the justified person, it presents a problem for the believer. Paul is using a great deal of sensitivity with his audience. Uh, you know, it's funny, uh, I, I tend to fellowship with a lot of guys that they, they're not really any respect of persons. If they don't like what you say, they're going to be straight up and tell you what, what they didn't like, why they didn't like it, you know, why you're wrong and maybe that makes you a bad person. <laughs> you know, so don't, don't get caught saying stupid stuff. 
Um, it's he interjects the, the term brethren here. Or do you not know brethren? And he interjects it, I believe, to speak to the Jew in the audience and remind them that Paul was also a Jew. <laughs> okay. You know, Hebrew of Hebrews, born of circumcised on the eighth day, raised in the scriptures as touching the law, Pharisees, all of that. Okay. And then he says, I'm speaking to those who know law. No Greek article here. They know law. What law? Any law. Well, Moses, sure. Greek law, whatever. Roman law, barbarian or Scythian law, doesn't matter. He's even stating it in a way that is making really an a priori presupposition for the hearer. I know that's a mouthful. Um, he, he's making this like a question that really needs no answer because everyone knows it. Um, I'm not talking about apologetics, please. Let's not get into that. I'm not really an apologist at heart of a pastor, although I think I can use them. I prefer just to teach the scriptures. I mean, what's, what's that? You know, um, Paul says that the law only has jurisdiction over living people. That does seem to be kind of self-evident, doesn't it? You know, let's say a person on a motorcycle has caused a serious accident by speeding and ignoring traffic signs in a way that was fatal to themselves. Do you know what you will never find in a scene like that? An officer bending over the corpse, writing him a ticket. Why? What would the point be? The person is dead. That's a little beyond the jurisdiction of the officer. Okay, and Paul is about to use a very familiar example in a very limited fashion. It's important to point that out. Okay, verse 2. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. Now I need to start here with a little bit of a warning. Don't use this as a proof text for marriage statutes. Okay, this is not what Paul was talking about here. Uh, and if you do use this as any kind of theological support for that, you're going to come away with a very inconsistent view of marriage when you push it back through Matthew, Luke, etc. Okay, it just won't stand up anywhere in the New Testament. Paul's using this in a limited way. And, and, and we'll see this at the conclusion of the, of the, of the statement here. Uh, you really can't do this for the reasons I've stated. So what is Paul saying? He's giving, he's giving an example of the jurisdiction of the law only being over living people. Read it carefully like we always do. If a married woman is bound by the law while her husband is alive and she is released from the law concerning him if he dies, Paul is showing that marriage is only binding while both parties live. And that's all he is saying. He's not saying anything else here don't try and make it. Otherwise, you end up like my uh, systematics theology professor. You tell I didn't like what he had to say a whole lot. He's a great guy. Just, you know, he tried to make himself the smartest guy in the room, and he came across as one of the dumbest. It's just that way. Um, you know, that's all Paul says here. It's the next verse anyway that seems to cause all the problems. So we're going we're gonna to get into it. Verse 3. So then, if while her husband is living... She is joined to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, even though she's joined to another man. Paul is now giving a circumstance under which that law becomes broken. Paul, of course, is correct. However, Paul, remember, is only using the verse in a limited sense. If the woman, while her husband is alive, becomes married to another person, she's an adulteress. Of course that happens. She becomes a lawbreaker, a bigamist, actually, a polygamist. She has more than one spouse. However many there is there, right? Uh, that's, that's all Paul is saying here. This is not Paul making law. 
It's him applying law in a way that everyone during his time could recognize. There are legitimate reasons for divorce that involve the protection of women. Even the Mosaic law recognized that. See what could happen if you build your theology around a verse without doing it in the context of an entire understanding of what the scriptures really say. You know, um, and again, Paul reiterates that when he talks about what happens if that husband were to die, the married woman would be released from her legal obligation and be set free from this law and all of its penalty, which you recall was death by stoning. Now, how much is she set free? Anyone going to take a crack at that? Well, she set as free as she was before she was married. She's like, she, before she was an unmarried virgin, she could choose to marry anyone she pleases. Though, if she's a believer, we would have to do the minimum will of God. Now, how do we know that this is a limited application only? Because of what it says now here in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Therefore, my brethren, you were also made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. He's not talking about married women or husbands or you know adultery and what that means. Paul places us believers into the example as the married woman. That's how we know. You know, we also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, it says so that we may be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We were made to die to the law so that God could join us to Christ in his resurrection, him who was raised from the dead, so that we might bear fruit to God. Wow, what does that even mean? Uh, you know, I, I think one of the places that comes immediately to mind is Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, but okay, there, there's a charismatic guy in the back of the room waving his hand about, but what about the gifts of the Spirit? What about the gifts of the Spirit? Okay, I'll answer that. I think he deserves an answer. First, you know, let's, let's look at the passage a little bit. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. I'll just read it for you. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the name of God works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another a word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, another to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, I'm going to use the current English equivalent to that, and to another discernment, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works in all these things because God never anywhere calls these gifts fruit. These gifts are only ever called the gifts of the Spirit. And it is the only place that lists off a list of gifts of the Spirit, unquote. This is the only place, this passage, Likewise, the earlier fruit of the Spirit are only ever listed off and named the fruit of the Spirit in the, those two verses of Galatians 5. Now, you know, there are other things. There's, you know, the, the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of, of knowledge, the, all of that stuff. And that, that can all be a worthy consideration. But the point is, is you have to be a careful reader of Scripture. God uses completely different words here, and to say otherwise is what is called by theologians an ontological category error. Um, for, in English, for you non-theologians, you're calling something by the wrong name. Fruits 
are something you consume, while gifts are something you open, for example. These belong to different categories. We are clearly talking about fruit, something that blossoms as a result of our actions, uh, as opposed to gifts, which is something that God gives to whoever he pleases. Don't be a charismaniac. Don't make all this about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One gift is which, of which is discernment. Use a little here. You know, John says it like this in 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. He even gives you things to look for if you're interested. But you'll have to read the rest of 1 John for yourself. Okay? Verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our, of our body to bear fruit for death. Okay, now we're back to the idea of fruit. You know, we're supposed to be bearing fruit for God. Now that, to me, is the fruits of the Spirit. And, and, and beyond, but think about that. Remember in the last chapter that Paul made a contrast between something he called our old anthropos, or our old man, and a new nature that Christ purchased for us and gave us as a part of our redemption by his willing and knowing sacrifice on the cross? Well, he's under that topic again, okay? It's the old nature versus the new nature. How does Paul describe that old man? It's important that we learn to recognize the description because we need to see it in ourselves first so that we can mortify it. And discernment calls for us to see it in others as well so that we may test those spirits to see if they come from God. He calls it the flesh, yes, but he says that these are the same things as the sinful passions that were aroused by the law. Think about this. Did you really want that bottle over there until someone drew your attention to it by telling you you couldn't have it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably not. So to make this practical, do homosexuals decide that they're homosexuals in a vacuum? My contention is that you make it an option either by strongly forbidding it or by making it something preferred to the max like we see today. Wrong is wrong, beloved, and, and context is irrelevant where the flesh is concerned. It simply wants because it wants, and it will never really be satisfied either. So, great, I'll be a homosexual. Um, but say, you know, Am I ever going to be happy with that, regardless of how gay I describe myself? Now, do you understand what they're doing with the English language? Verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not oldness of the letter. You know, I thank God that we've been released from all that nonsense, personally. We no longer have to be the way that we were with Barbara, okay? Uh, we have been released from the law because we have died. Okay, I can see there are a few people who are not Streisand fans. I'm not apologizing. I think it's a funny joke. Um, anyway, we've all been immersed into the faith, into Christ, from chapter 6. This is the result of a lot, has the result, rather, of allowing us to be raised with him too, so that we now serve in newness of the spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit, and not the oldness of the letter, that's adherence to a codified set of rules. To summarize, Paul, using the example of a married woman who has been set free by the death of her husband, is saying that we, like the woman who has in freedom given by that death, been, past tense, joined to another, that one being, him to that one being, him who was raised from the dead, that is Christ, so that we may bear fruit for God. That fruit is a result of our growth as Christians, by the way, and it cannot be helped, and it cannot be hidden. We also determined that this fruit is ontologically different than the gifts 
which God gave each member of the church when they were saved to use for the benefit of the church. God gives whatever he wants to whomever he wants. I'll avoid the whole cessationist continuationist argument here because it isn't really necessary here. Um, a sovereign God does whatever he wants, whenever and with whoever, for whatever reasons, whether we understand them or whether we don't. Paul has basically said that we have died with Christ and have therefore been set free from the law because of that. And there are reasons. So let's see what that means in the next section. Verses 7 to 13, evil sin kills through the good law. <clears throat> now, doubtless, there were a good number hearing this uh, that were wanting to stone Paul here because he was making the law out to be a bad thing in their thinking. And as we've already discussed, this is because they had an almost built-in reverence for the law. Uh, it likely didn't help that they were the ones who originally had the oracles of God that had written the law uh, that you know, God had once given to their forefathers. And Paul is about to disabuse any of those individuals of that notion in this next paragraph. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Not ever. On the contrary, I would not, I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would not have come to know sin except for through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had said, you shall not covet. Think about that. You know, in Paul's usual, usual fashion, he's going to deal with it head on and run it over like with a transport. The first thing Paul does is ask another of those rhetorical questions with really self-evident answers. Is the law sin? Well, not ever. There's that same strong no he used in chapter 6 all the way through and earlier. In fact, he uses another phrase we all know in English. Allah, which means but. Or, well, it means but, but to mark out opposition to what was just said, kind of like on the other hand, or as the translators used, on the contrary. So what did he say? On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. And that Greek word for known is gnosko, to recognize or to perceive. Paul is saying that the use of the law here is to recognize what it means to miss the mark, or sin, or not satisfy the standard set by God. He then uses another example, covetousness. He would not have known what that means to covet something if the law had not said you shall not covet. We can avoid all, all but the most general definitions of what that may mean here, but it means to want something so badly you'll do anything to get it, including lie, cheat, steal, kill, like that. Why can't, why can we avoid why can we avoid all but the most general definitions? Because we're talking about the most general application, not specifics here. Verse 8, but sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now with an understanding that the law is not sin, it introduces sin into its proper place in the equation as an opportunistic interloper. And watch what happens when sin is introduced. It opportunistically takes advantage of the commandment. And because it resides in the flesh already, our old man, our old self, the natural or the fallen individual, whatever terminology you want to use, it provokes the flesh in the direction of violating the law. And this is one of the reasons that the word sin uh, is equated with the word lawlessness. It is the opposite of law. What law? Any law. In the case of coveting, it produces all kinds of covetous desires for the natural man to act on. Coveting of every kind. So much for antinomianism. You cannot expunge this kind of desire simply by removing the standard, my friend. 
The problem isn't the standard. I mean, apart from the law, sin as a power is dead, right? That's what Paul said. Verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the command came, when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. Maybe, maybe not. It's not the main issue, I suppose, but still, sin is inside of the natural man because that natural man is still under the curse that God placed on the earth. And sin as a phenomenon is still operational in that natural man. Paul says it here like this. I was alive apart from the law. No law, no opportunity for sin to operate. Introduce a standard or a law of some kind, sin becomes alive. And when that happens in the natural man, the natural man will act on it and die because of sin. Sin earns for us that death penalty that we've been talking about. And Paul logically advances that thought further. Verse 10. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. You see? The commandment was meant to result in life by God who gave it. Instead, it gave nothing but death and condemnation for the failure to keep that legal standard. How'd that happen? Verse 11. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. See? Sin, an opportunistic, lying killer, coming from the direction it was originally intended to bless us. Fooling us into thinking we're doing the right thing, when all the while we're earning wrath and condemnation, either because we don't understand the standard and error, or wish what is against the command, and seek it out in contravention of the standard. There are other ways it could fall as well, but aren't those depressing enough? Verse 12. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. See, the law is not the issue. It was given by God. It's holy and righteous and good. There is nothing at all wrong with the law. The problem, beloved, is us. <laughs> and it's in us. But did this actually come from the law or the giving of the law? No, no, actually not. Here's the reason, verse 13. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? Not ever. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Paul asks uh, this as another of his uh, uh, by now famous rhetorical questions uh, ever used as a teaching device. Did that good law become a cause, cause of death for me? Not ever. And he explains that sin did this all by itself. And that's one of the reasons we call it sin. The standard is good and right. But by coming at us from the direction that should have instead given us blessing, the standard is untouched and remains holy, but sin becomes utterly sinful. Now, clearly when a standard of any kind is given, by God especially, but any standard will do, uh, it is for the blessing and protection of those for and to whom it is given. The nature of sin itself is lawlessness, and it will always take the sinful, natural man in the direction of sin, and that will always result in death. Sin is not the same as the standard. Lawlessness does not use the law standard lawfully. Our and Paul's problem is that each of us still dwells in our fleshly body, despite being given a new and godly nature in Jesus Christ. This also has implications. Pardon. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at the last paragraph. It's, it's the longest one. Verses 14 to 25. The conflict of old and new natures. This has set up the whole struggle for the Christian. While we are trying to dutifully and lovingly please our God by obeying what he says, 
This entity called sin is actively working against us to pull us down as far as it can to our destruction. Remember here the Puritan John Owen's words, if you are not killing sin, you may be assured that sin will be killing you. And that's what we've come to see as a choice to either serve sin or to serve the true and living God as Christians. Unbelievers have no choice at all. Uh, they must serve sin and no other choice is possible unless God grants them repentance. And that's, by the way, the very reason we evangelize, to give everyone a chance to at least hear about the other option. You know, uh, and for those that do not want this, they can be at peace that God will never do violence to their will, as it says in section three of the Westminster Confession and the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Let's have a look at what Paul's talking about. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, soul, into bondage to sin. Now Paul starts his line of reasoning here and he states that the law is spiritual. We may take that as a given here, uh, because we have the entire Old Testament as a reference. However, Paul is stating the problem, although the law is spiritual, we are decidedly not. We are flesh and sold into sin, literally. The word bondage doesn't actually occur in the Greek. I uh, found that interesting. If we are sold into sin because we are in the flesh, according to what Paul has said so far, then we're not able to do anything but serve our master, sin. Verse 15, for what I'm doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Isn't this interesting? When serving his master, sin, he does not understand what he's doing. That puzzled me for a moment until I remembered what Jesus prayed while he was on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. And then they cast lots and they divided up his garments among themselves. That's Luke chapter 23, verse 24, or verse 34, sorry. However, it doesn't remove us from accountability. Well, I don't understand what I'm doing, too. It's not my fault. No, that's not what that, that means. Um, and there's proof here in the verse. Um, we even realize this because we hate the thing we're doing. And we're still aware that there's a difference between that right thing and doing that thing we hate. So, yeah, it doesn't remove us from responsibility. Verse 16. Uh, wait, I'll stop there again. You know, I, have, I had some problems reconciling that. Because, you know, uh, if, if it's really true that God has made a definite atonement. One certainly questions why he never would, but um, how then is this a choice? And then I realized I don't have to reconcile it. You just have to believe it and, and go with it because there are some things in Scripture that you're just not going to understand in your human form. Will we understand it after that? Well, I hope so, but you know, I'm not going to be disappointed if the answer to that is no. Verse 16, we'll, we'll move on. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. And this is the point where all the Jews put all the stones back on the ground. <laughs> okay, Even in the breaking of the law, because of how Paul knows that he's breaking the law to sin, and he hates that he's doing it, and he can't seem to stop himself, he's actually agreeing with the law and not the thing he's doing. And that helps him and all of us to know that the law is good. Even if we can't keep it, we know that it's good and we need to acknowledge that because that's what Paul was doing here. Verse 17. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now from everything Paul has just said, the one way we cannot interpret this is basically to say the devil made me do it. Okay? Uh, Paul is not speaking about whose fault your sin is. He's well past that. It's yours, like it or not. This is about 
who is responsible for the sin when a Christian sins and he didn't really even want to or know what he or she was doing. The Christian, uh, let's say me, still did it. And I still must answer for it. But as we go on, we begin to realize that our flesh, our natural man, as I am terming it, still has that sin or lawlessness in it. And this sets off a titanic struggle between my flesh and that new spiritual man that Christ has made. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. <laughs> uh, now, I had to stop and think about who exactly was saying this? The Apostle Paul was saying this. Beloved, he says that no good thing dwells in him. <clears throat> You know, that's his old man, his flesh, his former nature. How can we know? Well, first of all, it's the Apostle Paul that's saying it. You know, second, because in himself, he finds a willingness to be good and to do the right thing. But not the ability to do what is right and good. And if Paul is like that, you can bet so are we. Because the same Lord saved us by the same sacrifice. Even as a Christian, we are not capable in our old nature of doing that good and right thing, the thing that God has decreed us to do. That's why he calls it the law and said, here, keep the law. Uh, verse 19. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. Paul is saying that there is something in our old nature that is making us do the opposite of what we know to be right and good. The very fact that Paul himself cannot get this right tells him and us that there is something in him and us that is making it this way. Verse 20, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, he said that once before. He's making the point again. Paul is saying that if you're doing something other than the right and the good that you want to do, that thing is called sin. And it's dwelling in you, that is in your flesh, from the previous verses, where it still has purchase, and it is the primary cause of your problems about why you don't do the good you know you should do, and you do do the things you know you shouldn't by default. You live in the flesh, and it has this principle of lawlessness in you that just won't leave it alone. Verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good. Now, to put a finer uh, name on the principle, Paul says that, quote, evil, unquote, is present in me. The word for evil uh, means something roughly equivalent to poor character in its usage. Uh, it is the opposite of good. This evil that is present in him and us prevents us in the flesh from doing what is good and right. And it really makes sense. Sure, we, we might be redeemed, but we still have a fleshly body, and that still holds some sway over our actions. <laughs> and, and, and believe me, I know a couple of come-along uh, type maneuvers from jiu-jitsu. You, you, you could take a swing at me, and you'd end up being escorted out the door by me, and you wouldn't be able to stop because I have a hold of your body. I could make your body behave. That's what sin does to us. It holds sway over our actions, much like a skilled uh, master of jiu-jitsu. When we sin, it is not our new nature in Christ. It is our old nature that was sold into sin by our own sin and by one original one in Genesis chapter 3. Make sense? Verse 22. 
for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. You know, I, uh, I actually had to pause for a few moments when I read that. What I wondered was why is it off by itself in isolation when Paul is narrating his own private struggle really as an archetype for all sort of, sorts of Christians. We, we know that what has come before is that evil lies in us, even as Christians in what we've called our old nature, in, in the terminology we've decided to apply here. Why does this phrase occur here? I wondered out loud as I made myself a fine cup of Yorkshire tea. You know, it's a great orange pico. Uh, I took a nice, hot, bitter sip of it, and then the Holy Spirit opened the passage up. This is here to give us hope. <laughs> okay, Christians go through these things. They cause terrible trial and soul searching in all of us to the point where sometimes we wonder if God really redeemed us at all and, and, and over minor things, you know. But beloved, one of the proofs that God has saved you or caused you to be born again, a new from above, regenerated, justified, whatever term you want to use for it, is that when you read the law, the written word of God causes you inner joy. The chances are that if you will know that joy, God has saved you. It doesn't mean your life isn't unmanageable or even good, but it does mean that God chose you to be his from before time began. We'll see more of that next, uh, next couple of weeks. And that should give you hope. Remember, the New Testament uses hope to mean a future certainty and expectation. Society uses it to mean something we wish would happen with no real support or possibility of outcome. The Winnipeg Jets will win the Stanley Cup this year. No. They're my team, but no. <laughs> okay? Um, use the New Testament meaning here. The, in this usage, joy means to delight. Uh, to delight with oneself inwardly in a thing. Uh, I used to get that definition, Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament words. So that's what they said, and I'm not going to argue the point. The word here is one word for joyfully concur. Uh, in this instance, and the delight with yourself, in this case, is with the word of God. And it's an inner joy, an experience that seems to be able to occur regardless of how your circumstances are going or how they make you feel. Uh, no matter how much trouble you might be in, this joy will fill you to the point that you will live and respond differently. Do I understand all of that? Not even close. <laughs> Verse 23. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. You know, this is pretty heavy stuff. And it turns out, to, apparently, that we need that hope and joy, <laughs> okay? Because there's a different law in our own bodies that moves us in a direction counter to the way that we would now want to go. It opposes the new nature, and it makes the believer a prisoner of the law of sin within themselves. And there is likely not a moment of a day that goes by that we don't somehow know it for ourselves. We struggle, all of us, with our own sins. I certainly do. Some of you shared in friendship your circumstances with me. And it helps both you and I to fellowship about that. As I said earlier, the fact that sin is operating in you does not remove you uh, from you personal responsibility because you've still done it. Uh, and some things, we don't seem like we're able to stop. It's no wonder that Paul makes the following declaration. Verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, beloved, if you're in that place, I concur. It's a pretty dark place, isn't it? Who here is familiar with a wonderful song written by a man named John Newton called Amazing Grace? I think pretty much everybody knows the song by heart. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, right, 
like me. You know, over the years, I've had a number of people tell me how much they hate that song, including my own mother, not just her. Um, when I ask why, I have only ever gotten one universal answer. And it goes something like this. And I'll, I'll try and clench my teeth to give you that. I am not a wretch. And it's said just about like that, just about that tone. But what's wrong with being a wretch? I mean, I, I know what it sounds like, but you know, grace has been made, made available so that you can be saved from your wretchedness. The word wretch is actually a description of your emotional state. Um, it's a direct synonym of the word miserable. I'm miserable. I'm a wretch. Friends, if you're really a Christian and you want to love, serve, and please the Lord, but you can't because this evil is clearly in your natural man stopping you even a part of the time, this makes you miserable. You're wretched. And if you're not, well, the only reason I can think of is that you're not truly one of his chosen people. Don't be downcast. I could add the word yet. Um, because you can become one of his chosen people. You can be delivered from the body of this death. How dare you? How? Well, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> oh, oh dear friends. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Well, that's how, really, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has already paid the price of your redemption and given you a new nature that wants to serve him. And what Paul is doing here is actually setting up the next chapter. But this states in most clear terms as to what's going on here. We are in a war. Now, it's a very strange kind of war because we're not on the attacking side. Nor are we on the defending side. We are, in fact, the battleground. Both desire, both the desire to serve the Lord and the desperate need to serve sin and ourselves are also in us. And the two ideals are at war, all out war inside us. You know, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God that Jesus has redeemed us and that as Martin Luther wrote that great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and He shall win the battle. Now, that's what chapter 7 is talking about. And it seems like a terrible place to stop for today, because frankly, it's really depressing. Um, but if we were just to end the book of Romans here, we wouldn't be seeing the entire gospel. Okay? Next week, we're going to be into chapter 8, and we're going to see it all. However, we're going to break chapter 8 into two parts, and this is important. Um, the first part, Romans, we're going to call that Romans 8a, will consist of verses 1 to 25. So next week, come with Romans 8, 1 to 25, summarized, kind of like you see it on the board here. And the second part, therefore, becomes Romans 8b, and it'll be from 26 to 39. That way, I hope we can bring out some of the real deep richness in that chapter. Uh, and as a way to end on hope, I'm going to end our consideration of Romans chapter 7 with the very first verse of chapter 8. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter how intense the battle within may become, there is no condemnation for those that are in the Savior. So make sure that you are, in fact, in the Savior by repenting of your sins and believing that he died in your place, and that God the Father raised him from the dead, according to the scriptures. And we'll see more about the mechanics of that in Romans chapter 10, in fact. But that's Romans chapter 7, and we'll see you next time for Romans chapter 8a. 
So, as always, the notes that I made for this study will be posted to BereanNation.com tonight at about 9 p.m. God willing, if the automation works. And if not, well, <laughs> I'll have to try and make it work, won't I? And I'll try and get a replay of the live stream of this evening up there as well. Um, if you would like a copy of this message on DVD, it'll be available for the cost of $10 Canadian, plus any shipping and handling we have to, to pay to get it to you. And that's just the cost of making stuff, folks. I'm not able to, uh, to in good conscience, try and make money from this venture. Just send me an email with the chapter that you want, and, and we'll make one for you. And I'm not sure that you really need one because um, it's on YouTube for free. So what do you need one of mine for? As long as you have an internet connection, you can access the stuff on YouTube for free. Um, if you have any questions or if you just want to say hi, you can reach me by email at pastorjer at outlook.com. Pastor has an E attached to the end of it. Jer is spelled with a G. Um, you see the address, Pastor Jer. Uh, it was taken by somebody who's not me. Anyway, um, just make sure you use the Latin word for pastor. Uh, it's pastor, pastor with me on the end. That'll come to me. Uh, that word means shepherd. That's my calling. I take it seriously. I should probably mention we're on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Nation and join us. It's maybe a great way to gift the ministry with your financial support, if that's what you feel the Lord wants you to do. Um, not going to make or break me one way or the other, folks. So whatever you think. I did want to mention that I have a book. It's called Practical Discipleship. You can get it from Amazon. It's a great guide for what's important to the believer's life. By examining what the very first group of Christians ever did, it's priced at $4 if you really need to have a hard copy, but if you can live with the Kindle thing, 99 cents US. Uh, again, the pricing is just reflective of the time that I put into the book to write it, and printing, shipping, and handling in case of the hard copy. And if you're in the Ottawa area and you like what you've seen here, why don't you come and say hi to us on a Sunday morning at Bethany Baptist Church. Now, I'm either leading the singing from over there, leading the worship from over there, or occasionally I get to preach from right here. Um, anyway, come say hi. I'd love to meet you. Let's close and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you brought us here tonight to study from your word in Romans chapter 7. Lord, we know that and we feel that, that war uh, that is between our old and our new natures every day. And Lord, we pray that you would be uh, remaking us so that we would continue to choose from the new nature, not for behavior modification reasons, but Lord, because we love you and we want to serve you, and this is how we learn to do it. Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands this evening, asking that you would be with us as we go from this place. In his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so long from Bethany Baptist Church and BereanNation.com. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye, bye, everybody. Okay? And keep studying the scriptures daily just to make sure these things are so.